tell you about one other gentleman that I met uh, just a few years back. I was playing a, a, a show in, uh, in Winchester, Virginia, uh, which is right at the head of the Shenandoah Valley, northernmost part of the state. And, uh, and it was a summertime show. Uh, it's, it's a place I play every couple of years, the big outdoor concert series they have during the warm months. And Winchester is a, is a town that's known primarily for two things. It's uh, known for their apples and as the home of Patsy Cline. Uh -huh. Both things to be proud of in my book. And because it's an outdoor show, um, they don't really have like a backstage area, so you, you, you come off of the, the stage, which is really, I think, uh, like a flatbed truck. And, and the whole audience who wants to talk to you is just sort of gathered around there. <laughs> it takes you hours to get away from there. <laughs> and it's fine because it's, they're lovely people and, and, and I know that this one guy is going to be there every time. It's a guy I've met and befriended over the years. He's a local preacher. And uh, I, I, what I mean by local is his church is there. But he's definitely not from the valley. By his accent, I put him somewhere in South Georgia. And one of the reasons I love talking to this fellow is not only does he have that sort of very preacherly stentorian voice, but he's the kind of guy who you can tell reads the thesaurus for pleasure. <laughs> and he came up to me the last time I played there. John, I have been to your worldwide website. <laughs> and I have discerned that you do not have far to journey to, to your next engagement tomorrow. I've also obtained the name of the hotel in which you are residing tonight. <laughs> so I've taken the liberty of arranging a luncheon appointment for you. I'll pick you up at noon. And I could tell by the way he said all this that he was not the luncheon appointment. I said, well, can you give me any clue as to with whom I might be dying? He said, oh, I could. But I would prefer not. But I guarantee you, you will be pleased. Now, a guy who talks like that is a prompt sort of fellow. And he was right there at midday at my hotel. We hopped in his car and headed north on Interstate 81. Now, those of y'all who know your geography know there is not a whole lot of 81 left north of Winchester in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we quickly passed into the panhandle of the great state of West Virginia and took exit number two, which, as you all know, is marked Harper's Ferry, Shepherdstown, and Charlestown. Took the fork toward Charlestown, drove a few miles down the road, turned up a farm lane, parked in front of one of the prettiest little houses he ever saw. And there to greet us at his gate was a gentleman by the name of Frank Buckles. Now I can tell by the look on some of y'all's faces that this name is talking at the end edge of your memory. And it ought to because Frank Buckles was all over the national news about six or eight months ago when he passed away at the age of 110. He was the last surviving World War I veteran in this country. And as I shook his hand at his front door, I said, Mr. Buckles, it's such an honor to meet you. I have heard so much about you. And this little natally dressed gentleman opened his mouth and said, Yeah, I've heard a lot about you too. <laughs> he led us into his living room, and I went down to sit on the sofa, and he said, Oh, no, you know. Open up that guitar case. I've heard a lot about that song. Never have heard that song. Why don't you sing me that song, please? So I did. I sang him that song. This song. After which he regaled me with an afternoon of his adventures in World War I. He was born in a small town in southwestern Missouri. When, his, when he was still a young boy, his family moved to Oklahoma, where when he was not yet 16 years old, like so many young men of his era, he went down to the courthouse, lied about his age, and enlisted in the army. And 
and was shipped over to Europe where he served under General Pershing. Whose sense of style and dress he greatly admired. So much so that one day when Pershing pulled in a surprise inspection of his troops, he happened upon the young private Buckles who was dressed exactly like him. <laughs> Which as you might suspect, <laughs> caught his eye and he was pressed into service to become Pershing's driver and from all accounts they were quite a pair. It did not last long because it was soon discovered that Buckles was not old enough to have a driver's license. <laughs> and in the kind of logic that reigns only in the battlefield, he was then reassigned to be an ambulance driver. <laughs> And it was the proverbial, how are you going to keep him down on the farm? And he could not imagine returning after what he had seen and done to rural Oklahoma. So he worked for a series of shipping companies, lived all over the world. He lived in South America for years. He was working in the Philippines in 1942 when the Japanese invaded. And he spent most of the balance of that war as a civilian prisoner of war. But ever the dandy he, on his first day of internment, he took his last pair of cleaned and pressed clothes, wrapped them in plastic, and buried them under his bunk. So that when the camp was liberated in 1944, he was the lone POW to greet the incoming GIs in clean and pressed clothes. <laughs> At the end of our visit, I, I said, Mr. Buckles, did you ever reckon you'd live this long? And he looked at me with this astonished expression and said, of course. <laughs> As he walked us to the car at the end of our visit, he said, you know, McCutcheon, you got a lot of things in that song wrong. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't doubt that at all. He said, my God, man, didn't you do any research? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> I just heard the story and then I figured it needed a song, so I just wrote it right then and there. And I, I mean, I made up the guy's name and where he was from and what happened really happened, but no, I didn't do any research. I said, well, I didn't think so. Because you ought to know that there was no gas in 1914. It didn't come around in the next year. Trust me. I know. Duly noted. You gonna change the song? Nah. I didn't think so. <laughs> but the biggest mistake you make is you make it sound like it only happened once. The name is Francis Tonger. I called the little Two years ago the war was waiting for me after school. Belgium and to Flanders, to Germany to here. I fought for king and country, I loved it dear. It's Christmas in the trenches, where the frost so bitter hung. The frozen fields of France were still, no Christmas songs were sung. Our families back in England were toasting us that day. Their brave, glorious lives so far away. Well, I was lying with my messmates on the cold and rocky ground. When across the lines of battle came a most peculiar sound. It says, I now listen up the boys, each soldier strained to hear, as one young German voice sang out so clear. says to me, soon one by one each German voice joined in harmony. The cannons rest in silence, the gas clouds rolled over as Christmas brought us respite from the war. Well, as soon as they were finished, the reverend pause was spent. Our 
us and lads from Kent. The next day sang was still enough to silent night, says I, and into talk one song filled up that sky. Fixed on one more figure, charging from their side. His true flag like a Christmas star shone on that plane so bright as he bravely strode armed into the night. Soon, one by one on either side, walked into no man's land with neither gun nor bayonet. Shared some secret brand, we wished each other well. And in a flame and soccer game, we gave to hell. We traded chocolates, cigarettes, and photographs from home. These sons and fathers, far away from families of their own. Yeah. 